Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time we have this morning to open your word together. We invite your spirit's presence to direct and guide us in all that we do. We ask that you can correct us in any error in the, our understanding and that the light for our feet uh, can give us confidence and assurance as we continue our walk with thee by faith. Be with each of us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. I was having a little bit of computer problems there trying to figure out what to do. So um, what we're going to be looking at today is the connection between um, the events connected with the civil wars in 977 and 742 BC with the American Revolutionary Wars and Civil Wars. So we had started looking at this a little bit. Um, we, yesterday we looked at the symbol dealing with the 235 years and the 355 years and that this gave us connections to verses um, that had sh shed light and we're going to come back to that but shed light upon uh, the kingship and so the focus here is upon uh, the kingship of um, northern Israel and southern Israel um, when they divide. So we spent a lot of time looking at that. And of course, that makes sense in the context of Daniel chapter 11 with the civil wars between the North and the South and how that relates to the presidents of the United States. So there's lots of things we have to look at, understanding the civil war, um, et cetera. So <clears throat> we're going to look at that. Now, um, so just a couple of things before we look at this document, which we have in front of us, is that in the study yesterday, um, we were discussing Hezekiah's um, uh, illness when he uh, asked the, the sun to go back 10 degrees on the sundial. And so just a little note that Stephen placed on the video there was that if we... We recognize if we we recognize that as 40 minutes, that means that that day was extended by 2,400 seconds, right? So 40 times 60 is 2,400, so 2,400 seconds, making that day 88,800 seconds, right? So if the day is lengthened by 40 minutes. Or 2,400 sec seconds, then 86,400 is how many seconds there normally are in a day. 88,800 seconds. And then uh, Stephen noted that 88,800 seconds is uh, 26,640 halakim. A halakim is three and a third seconds. So you just take that number and um, divide it by three and a third, and then you get the 26,640 halakim, where a day is normally 29,500 and 25,920. Now, that number 26640 is 666 times 40, so it's just something to note. Um, interesting little detail. Okay. Now, so when we started looking at um, these uh, these connections, so the first thing is we talked about a 2,500-year period from the Stamp Act uh, to 2017. So, and and that has to do with these um, these events of these. Uh, what would we call it, um, counterfeit feast days. So what we had is from the repeal of the Stamp Act in 1766 to November 22nd, 2018. So it's not 225, 20 years, but 252 years, right? 
Um, <clears throat> now, what would be the significance of the repeal of the Stamp Act just before we start looking into the Stamp Act? Like as a symbol, why, why is a repeal of the Stamp Act uh, connected to uh, November 22nd, 2018? So that was the prediction that we had made, and we connected it to this repeal of the Stamp Act. What, what is the symbol that we had attached to November 22nd, 2018? So that's Trump's second Thanksgiving, where he's going to make that uh, phone call to the uh, to the different uh, military branches of the American government. What would the repeal of the Stamp Act have to do with that? I'm not picking up on the November 22nd. So it's the it's the Thanksgiving Day prediction in 2018. Okay. 252 years from 1766 to 2018. Okay. So that was part of the structure here. I'll just show it to you quickly. Um, part of this structure that I created back in 2018. Um, so you can see here, you've got from the center there up to the left, the repeal of the Stamp Act in 1766. And then I'm counting the 252 years to November 22nd, 2018. Now, with something like this, I don't have it to the date, right? Um, right. Uh, and somebody could say, well, we could go back to the year that the Stamp Act is enacted, and that would connect to November, you know, to 2017 instead. So there's definitely some arbitrariness in um, looking at this. But when we think about uh, the prediction of November 22nd, there was an idea of a restraint and a loosening. And so we could connect this somehow. Uh, and, and part of what Jeff had looked at is he had looked at this releasing of this turkey, right? So he thought that that was sort of the loosening. You had a, a turkey that was restrained, um, and then you pardon this turkey, right? And, and you let it go. It doesn't get killed. Of course, they're going to kill some other turkey, but... Um, so that's what Jeff thought was the symbol. And there's probably some significance in that connected with St. Thanksgiving. The chair's not working right. Okay. Um, so you have this uh, repeal of the Stamp Act, and, and that's what I connected is 252 years. Now, it's kind of just an observation. Um, it's not like... Uh, You know, that, that that was a major part of my line. But since we had the November 22nd, 2018 date already, I, I looked at an event back 252 years, and I thought that the significant event would have been this repeal of the Stamp Act. Okay, so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at different things in American history and try to see what their, what the symbolic connection is between them. So this may not be really important, this 252 years here. It might be some other place that we look at 252 years. The thing about it is there's a lots of events that happen in this history, in American history, and lots of events that are happening in our lives. But back in 2018, that is where I saw the significance. So this, this looks interesting. You know, I'm going to just say there's 252 years there. I could have easily taken this out. It wasn't really a major part of the study. But we still want to look at this Stamp Act. And uh, because it is a part of, I guess, a catalyst in the American Revolution. Um, so let's let's take a look. It's at It's a this. very large part of the catalyst of, of the American Revolution. Yeah, yeah. So, so we know that it is. Um, so now it says the Stamp Act. So this is a document Dwight put together for us, which is nice. Thanks, Dwight. Um, 
So the Stamp Act of 1765 was the first internal tax levied directly on American colonists by the British Parliament. The act which imposed a tax on all paper documents in the colonies came at a time when the British Empire was deep in debt from the Seven Years' War and looking to its North American colonies as a revenue source. So what is the Seven Years' War? This was a war that went on between Britain and France. Okay. Now, we should note the dates here because that Seven Years' War is interesting dates. It's one century before 1856 and 1863, that period of seven years that we mark uh, within uh, Millerite history turning into Adventist history, right? Correct. So, because we have in 1856, we have the publication of the seven articles by um, uh, Hiram Edson. And then on the 1863 chart, we don't have the 2520. So the 2520 is hidden in there, the prophetic mirror is. But we, we've noted that period of time to when the church is organized. So there's seven years there. So we have the Seven Years' War. It's one century prior to that. And and if we think about it, too, of course, 1863, uh, that's connected to uh, the Civil War. So there's the Seven Years' War uh, between Britain and France. It just happens to be those years. So seven years is a symbol. And then even the dates themselves, one century previous to that those important periods of seven years that we've recognized. Okay. And um, so the British Parliament passed the Stamp Act to replenish their finances after the costly seven years war with France. Part of the revenue from the Stamp Act would be used to maintain several regiments of British soldiers in North America to maintain peace between Native Americans and the colonists. Well, moreover, since colonial juries had proven notoriously reluctant to find smugglers guilty of their crimes, violators of the Stamp Act could be tried and convicted without juries in the vice admiralty courts. Um, okay, now, yeah. you understand what that means? Uh, a little bit. I mean, one is without a jury, that would be Roman law, or, well, it's not quite Roman law, but it's the idea is that you can just have a judge try and convict somebody. Okay. The jury. I, I recognize that this is probably not a point that many within this study are going to recognize. But if you if you walk into a current American court, mm-hmm. even a state or county court, mm-hmm you're going to observe a flag with a fringe on it. Okay. That I'm not aware of. What kind of flag? Okay. You'll have an American flag, but it's going to have a fringe. Okay. Now, what this is showing is that you are not under the jurisdiction of the American court system, you are under the jurisdiction of the military court system. Okay. Now, <clears throat> when you're dealing with this part of history, mm-hmm. because the British were upset that smugglers were not being found guilty in the American courts. Yeah. These violations on the Stamp Act could now be tried in the Vice Admiralty or the other way you'd say it in the military courts, especially the military courts of the Navy. These were much more, much more rigid and not as forgiving. Okay. And it's, it's interesting to me that Basically, since I believe about 1940, all of the courts in the United States display a flag that is fringed. I'll send up some other information on that. Okay. You can place 
Okay, so I'm reading here, it says, in recent years, a non-historically based conspiracy argument used by tax process protesters is that an American court displaying an American flag with the gold fringe is in fact an admiralty court and thus has no jurisdictions. Courts have repeatedly dismissed this as frivolous. They've been that this, what you're talking about? That uh, no, I'm I'm going because this is actually truth. It's it's not a conspiracy situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so I'm just, just trying to understand. Uh, so this fringe. So this is a gold fringe. Yes. Okay. So this has something to do with. So admiralty law that has to do with. So explain it again, because I'm having a hard time finding anything about this. Okay. It says there, oh, there's a bunch of things that say a fringe on a flag has nothing to do with admiralty courts. Okay. The significance of a gold fringe on the American flag. Yeah. Were first used on the flag as early as 1835. So where are you finding that? Uh, this is from the American Legion. Okay. So, okay, you just go on, read it. <clears throat> it was not until 1895 that it was officially added to the national flag for all regiments of the Army. For civilian use, the fringe is not required as an internal part of the flag, nor can it be said to constitute an unauthorized addition to the design prescribed by tra by statute. Now, this was something that was being added for military um, divisions, whether you're talking Navy, whether you're talking Army. Basically, it's, it's showing that there is a difference as to, as to why, what court has the jurisdiction. So... Okay, so everything that I see here says that that's a myth. Now, I'm opening another site as we're speaking. Gold fringe was not the same flag that's approved for a constitutional republic under USA Code Title IV, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. Anyway, everything I'm reading here says that that's, there's not, no truth to the fringe having anything to do with uh, okay. Admiral Diction. All right. So that that's just a myth. Okay. <clears throat> but anyway, this this is of course factual about uh, uh, what happened with the Stamp Act. It's very direct about this with the Stamp Act. Yes. That's so I'm going to accept that. Um. Okay. So. The, the next point was that instead of levying a duty on trade goods, the Stamp Act imposed a direct tax on the colonists. This act required, starting in the fall of 1765, legal documents, printed materials must bear a tax stamp provided by commission distributors who would collect the tax in exchange for the stamp. This law applied to wills, to deeds, newspapers, pamphlets, playing cards and dice. Mm -hmm. Now, what I what I was finding interesting to fix this in my in my mind mm -hmm. was that when the parliament passed the Stamp Act, this was a very controversial taxation measure which forced colonists to purchase a British stamp for every paper product they obtained. Now, mm -hmm. At this point, let's let's put it in in terms that we would understand. If we were to purchase or receive signs of the times, or a a conference newsletter, mm -hmm. or a magazine, this tax would have to be paid. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> the tax ranged. From three pence to two pounds for each individual sheet of parchment, vellum, or paper, depending on the intended use. Uh -huh. A certificate or a diploma from an institution carried a two-pound tax 
which today would be the same thing as about $353. Okay. How many of us would like to pay $353 to receive a diploma? Yeah. yeah. But it, so it seems like a pretty heavy tax. Yes, it was. Yeah. Of course, you know, some is three pence. Um, but, you know, that could still be quite a bit. Uh, now, paper isn't as common then as now. I mean, we, we use tons and tons of paper, but it still would be something that's used quite a bit. And it would, it would, um, definitely uh, inhibit lots of activity okay. that is economically not viable. Well, the rest of this, a pack of playing cards mm -hmm. found in most households carried a one shilling tax. Now, a shilling to us doesn't does it really equate? I mean, we're talking yeah. 12, and a, 12 and a half cents at that time. Yeah. Currently, a shilling would be $8.60 in tax for something that most people would be paying a couple of, a couple of pennies for the playing cards. Yeah. So when you're saying a heavy tax, yes, this was a very heavy tax, but it was mm -hmm. being legislated without the colonists being able to say anything about it. Yeah, so that's one of the main things. Taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. So the colonists took exception to this provision that denied offenders trial by jury. In other words, you were going to be called into a military court. You don't get a jury. You get a judge. And if the judge decides I don't like what you've done. You're going to jail. And then the question was being asked, why does the British government want to garrison these troops in America after the threat from the French has been removed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's peacetime. Why is Parliament wanting to have garrison troops in North America? So they're looking at what are they doing? Are they going to try to, uh, you know, control the colony? In some way. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, the dates of all of these things I found very interesting, mm -hmm. especially when we're making use of the calendar converter. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when we look at the dates themselves, so the first one is that the Stamp Act is patched up, passed on March 22nd. 1765. Um, so that's going to be the 29th day of the 12th month, which um, yeah, the biblical year 508. Now, uh, so I, I put these in the calendar converter so that I have them here. So that date, March 22nd, is um, in the Mayan long count, it's 12. 7, 8, 11, 11. So one is the first four um, are the four digits of July 18, 2020, right? So that 1872, it's in a different order. And right. then, the, then the last two digits, right? Because, of course, the first one is a 12, right? So 12, 7, 8, those are, there's five digits in a Mayan calendar. And then the last two are 11-11, which reminds us of Daniel 11-11 and other 11-11s. Um, and then, uh, so the Islamic date, I'm not, you know, it's 1178, year 1178, um, and Ramadan 29. So um, now, now, Adar 29, that's the 12th month of the 29th day on the biblical calendar is the last day of the Jewish year. Right. Correct. So, so it's marking the last day of the year. Uh, with the Islamic calendar, it's the last day before the first day of the 10th month. Okay. So, so we have when I two, looked, two different symbols there. Yeah. 
when I was looking at the Islamic calendar in this, the digits as it shows for their year, 1178, yeah. has the, the digits for July 18th. Yeah. So mm-hmm. we have July 18th showing up both in the Islamic and in the Mayan long count. Yeah. But on top of that, in the Mayan long count, we also have the digits for midnight. Uh, yeah, so 12 7. Correct. So that's just uh, taking the 12 backwards. So if you're going, so if you go backwards, 7 2 1 instead of 1 2 7. Yeah. And then you have a doubling of 11. Right. It's like, okay. Now that, so that's going to be when the Stamp Act is passed. And then it get, becomes effective on November 1st, 1765. So that's going to be 224 days later. And um, so that's going to be uh, on the on the uh, biblical calendar. It's going to be the eighth month, the 17th day, which backwards is July 18, you know, 718. Right. And then 224 days is seven months and 10 days. Well, in the sense that this is, if you're just counting from, uh, so we're counting from uh, March 22nd. So you're going to count 10 months. That's going to bring you to October 22, right? And then you count 10 days. And that's going to bring you to November 1st. So it's seven months and 10 days on the Gregorian calendar. Correct. It's also one of the rare times that you find the biblical calendar and the rabbinic calendar in agreement on the month and day. Yeah. Well, it's not that rare, but it's, it's, it, it happens about 30 to 40 percent of the time. So okay. it's not, but yeah, so here in this case, we have them aligned. Okay. Then you were right. It is interesting because from the passage to effect where we have seven months and 10 days, we also have the symbol here, like you were saying, of October 22nd or the Day of Atonement. Yeah. With the, yeah. If you're counting it, you count seven months. It brings you October 22nd and then you have the 10 days. Right? And then. When we're looking at this on the date that it becomes effective, the year has the digits of 158. Yeah, so August 15th. Correct. So it has those, an iteration of those dates. Okay, um, of those digits. Now, then uh, the next one's going to be March 18th. So that's the act is going to be repealed. So uh, I assume it's after a lot of protest. I wasn't there. So um, what what happened to cause them to repeal it? Well, here again, there were protests within America. Mm-hmm. At that time, Frank Benjamin Franklin was living in London, and mm-hmm. he went he made a personal appeal because oh. this was a very heavy tax. Yet, there were those within the colonies that did not want to submit to direct authority of taxing by Great Britain. So, while the appeal was being made by Benjamin Franklin before the House of Commons, The Stamp Act was repealed on the 18th of March, but in the same day, a declaratory act was passed that set firmly in place Parliament's legal authority and supremacy over the colonies. In other words, Parliament has the right to pass laws without the colonies having any representation. 
this became the the very basis, the foundation of the objections that have gone on within America about no taxation without representation. Mm-hmm. So from the time that they passed this Stamp Act to the time that it was repealed, was 361 days. One day greater than a prophetic year. Yeah. Now, on the Mayan calendar, you can see that because the date is um, on the first one when it's it's voted or passed. That's going to be 12, 7, 8, 11, 11. And when it's repealed, it's 12, 7, 9, 11, 12. Right? So the 9 means... That the eight moved from nine, that's 360. And then that the, the final 11 moved to a 12, that's one day. So 361 days. Um, so, so the mind calendar sh- shows that really easily, uh, patterns of 361 days. Now, from when it went into effect to when it's repealed is 137 days. Now, a lot of these we look at in reverse. So, you know, 731 that relates to the week of christ with 31 a.d right right seven times 31 is 217 or wait never mind is that right what am i thinking i think i'm doing this now yeah yeah seven times 31 times seven i think it's 217 yeah 217 so that gives us the symbol of midnight which is already in that in that structure. And then you got, uh, in the mind count, it's 12, 7, so backwards, that's July 21st. You also have 9, 11, and then 12. So 9, 11, uh, being the, you know, symbol for 9, 11, and then the number 12 at the end. So 12, 7, 9, 11, 12 is the mind count. So, uh, you, you got a bit of a divergence with the rabbinic and the biblical there on the the, the biblical is uh, 13.6. And, uh, so, you know, 13 times 6. But both of those are numbers that, you know, represent um, uh, the number of men and the number of rebellion, right? You also have the Julian date is March 7th. So symbol for the Sunday law. So there's, there's a lot of symbols there. Um, now when, it, and then we have, you put in here, uh, the Boston Tea Party, right? So you got this in here. Right. So the reason for putting in that, we didn't mention it, uh, but it's, it's more the more famous, uh, uh, protest against, uh, taxation by the British. Well, the thing that I, I found intriguing from the time that the Stamp Act was initially passed to the time of the Boston Tea Party, we have just over 17 years. Mm -hmm. We have 3,191 days Mm -hmm. where we have these digits that can be used as 391. Yeah. And then we also have the first day of the 10th month, Correct. On the biblical calendar, which, um, uh, you know, is an important, uh, date. Now, now we had noticed in, um, the first date. So when the stamp act was, um, uh, passed, you know, that that was the last day of the Jewish year. The next day is going to be the first day of the first month. And then we have, um, let me see, what was that? It's the first day of the first month. And then we had uh, the Islamic date being the last day of the ninth month. So the next day being the first day of the, uh, well, actually, it's going to be the second last day of the ninth month. So first day of the 10th month would be two days later. Um, uh, but anyway, the point here is that uh, we have the symbol of the first day of the 10th month. So that, and that, that comes from the story of Ezra dealing with the divorce. 
And so you can see how this would relate to a divorce. And, and the whole idea that it's done according to the law. So these are conflicts of laws uh, that's part of American independence. It's part of a civil war, right? It's also interesting that um, now you have here, so you say it's so December 16th. Okay, so I'm going to get here. Yes, so you get the first day of the 10th month. And I'm just seeing what else is here. 3191, seeing if there's any other symbols here. Now, the Islamic calendar here then has also uh, the 187 in it, 1187, where the other one was 1178. Right. Okay, so uh, when it was first init- first given, it was 1178, and then you get to the Boston P- T part, it's 1187. So again, it has those digits for the year. And it's also the first day of the 10th month on the Islamic calendar. So that's interesting because they don't normally, the months don't normally line up. Right. Okay. So, so that's an interesting, uh, uh, structure there. Now, as far as then, so we have this, this connection to the Boston Tea Party. So we know that this is part of, of the American Revolution. It's going to lead up to, uh, what happens, what we call the American Revolution. Now, I'm not an expert on the American Revolution, all the events and dates and so forth, uh, but I know the Boston Tea Party. So one of the things we can see that's a parallel to what happens in the Civil War or the Revolution in 977 has to do with the fact that Jeroboam is basically going to be taxing the people that's why there is this revolution. Now, we have, so when we talk about uh, ancient Israel, and we talk about the kingdom of Israel under uh, David, you know, so Saul, David, and Solomon, it's sometimes referred to as the United Kingdom of Israel. Now, is there some parallel then in taking the United Kingdom um, and the United States breaking off and becoming a symbol of the ten tribes, right? That break off. Can we can we have a parallel there to to that event, or is that you know these these different states? Because we know there's going to be uh, 13 colonies that break off, right? Correct. Okay, so that's obviously different than the number 10, but we know that it's a symbol of rebellion, correct? Correct. And and we also know that there are really 13 tribes if we if we include the Levites and see Joseph's uh, two sons, the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim, as separate tribes. Because Joseph often just refers to Ephraim, where Manasseh is separate. So what would be the significance of of those symbols? Can we, can, the thing is, can we pair what happens in 977 with what happens in 1776, for instance? I think that we can make the application of what happened in 977 with what was going on from 1765 to 1775. Okay, so 1765 to 1775. Okay, the, the reason that, that I'm, I'm giving that 10-year span you have the passage of the tax of the, of the Stamp Act in 1765. Now, as, as we were just addressing this, that was a fairly high tax. I mean, if today we were to be asked to pay eight dollars and sixty cents for a deck of cards and be able to buy the cards for a dollar. That, yeah. then that's 860% higher than 
more tax than the value of the good itself. Yeah, it's like uh, the Canadian tax on cigarettes. Okay. You know, where you're paying probably that much over the cost of the product. Right. Or, so it be a pretty steep tax. Right now, I mean, I, I still shake my head at the taxes that are currently being charged on gasoline in Washington and Oregon because mm -hmm. the, the taxes now have gone up well over $2 a gallon. And this is not federal. This is strictly state. But by June 17th of 1775, you now have all of these attitudes flaring into what became the, the first battle of the American Revolution, which was Bunker Hill. Okay. And all of this was on taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. Now, in 977, the attitude that was taken was that if you think my father was taxing you too much, just wait until you see what I'm going to do. Right. Yeah. So there's a parallel there. I mean, and that's what it's about. It is about the taxation. Okay. Now, when it comes to the American Revolution, when we start looking at this against with the Civil War, the issue in the Civil War was the southern states wish to continue with the use of slavery. The northern states, which have the money, didn't want the slavery because they didn't want the onus of people basically making money from the enforced labor of others. One was producing goods. The other had been producing services. And you don't have one primarily without the other. So taxation without representation was the impetus to the colonies seeking to break free from Great Britain, telling the southern states, you cannot have slaves, we're not going to allow for slavery's expansion, became the impetus to the Civil War. Now, I find it interesting that there were slaves, of course, in Israel, right? Yeah. And yet, the slaves in Israel knew that there would be a day under which they would be freed. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Jubilee. Okay. Or the, the, yeah, or every seven years. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yet the slaves in America, the only freedom that they received were either when they were sold to another party or when they died. The first is not true freedom. The second is the repose of death. Mm -hmm. So this battle was being fought over, do we have the right to impose our will on another people? Now, it's interesting to me that the, the political party in America that was pro-slavery was the Democrats. Yeah. The first elected president on under the Democratic banner was the most vocal slaveholder we've ever had as president, and that was Andrew Jackson. He viewed that there was no value in the Negro race, and that there was no value in the Indians, that they were just brutes, they were just animals. Now, the premise of the Democratic Party ever since has been that there are people that are there, that they are nothing more than basically beasts of burden that are there to serve others. Mm -hmm. 
and that's the way they've been continuing since then. Okay, so so we have this repeal of the Stamp Act. So that's what that's the year that I marked. I didn't mark the when the Stamp Act went into effect. Um, so we could have from the year that the Stamp Act went into effect to uh, Trump's first Thanksgiving, we could have two fifty-two years, right? Okay. So now, but there's none of these dates really relate specifically to uh, Thanksgiving or anything like that. So, right. but, so anyway, with I, I think this the repeal of the Stamp Act is important. I wouldn't put it as a major part of this line. I have it there just because you know it was something that I had noticed. Normally, I just have the line like this. So sure, but so, but it's something I had put in. Oops, where am I going here? In the line, right? Just because you know it was there. Yeah, I don't know why this is. Over. Okay. So that um, so that the 235 years to Trump's first Thanksgiving. There isn't specifically something that marks the second Thanksgiving, right? I mean, I could put the 252 years in there, but putting the Stamp Act in there, it's a little bit arbitrary. But that's what I had done in 2018, just as an observation. Right? It wasn't a main argument. Mostly what I had done is I dealt with this November 22nd date, right? So when I looked at, at his the first Thanksgiving that he has, it's it's obviously November 23rd, not November 22nd. Um, and and that one's going to be the third day of the ninth month. So it was more lining up um, the 15th day of the eighth month and November 22nd by looking at these two different dates, November 22nd and November 25th. So the restraint would happen November 22nd. On our calendar, relating to November 22nd, 977 BC. And then, uh, the loosening would happen on the 15th day of the eighth month on the biblical calendar, which lines up with November 25th, 2018. So the events that happened at the American Mexican border on that date. So, I mean, people could look that up in the news and see, uh, about that Thanksgiving, what was said. But it wasn't really accepted by uh, Clayton, right? Uh, so Trump's hands restrained in that one, and then Trump's hands loosed is what I had put um, in that history. And then, um, and that's now, uh, to be fair, I didn't actually fully understand uh, the November 25th date in 2018. So I mostly had just marked the November 22nd date, and that didn't line up with the 15th day of the eighth month, right? So, so it's just later afterwards that I placed the November 25th date after the event, and then I saw that that lined up with the 15th day of the eighth month. So it wasn't really part of my prediction. I just had November 22nd, Trump's hand would be loosened, or restrained, and then then it would be loose. And so it was restrained on November 22nd, though it was on the Monday before Thanksgiving that the court made their uh, judgment. Um, but it's going to be on the 22nd that Trump, uh, that he's actually acting, and that there's this restraint upon him that was put on him a few days previous. But then it's going to be loosed, oddly, even though there's this Ninth Court Circuit injunction um, we have things that occur that uh, would have gone against that injunction, from what I understand. Um, so, you know, Clayton took that all as a leftist conspiracy theory that none of this happened, though it was well documented. So I'm not not quite sure why it mattered that it was a conspiracy theory, even even if it was some kind of conspiracy theory, it still as a symbol still worked, but. But Jeff just put it to the loosening of the Thanksgiving turkey. So we have these um, these dates. Now, the one thing about the November 22nd, 2018 Thanksgiving, it's on November 9th um, on, on the Julian calendar. So that was another thing that was just interesting about 
that, that it's from a Julian date. It gives us that symbol of November 9th, which back in November of 2018 was something that was still new to us, looking at November 9th as a symbol. Just only been, you know, a month and a half since we had had that symbol introduced by Tess. So so we have this um, 235 years so that we talked about to that first Thanksgiving of Trump's. And that's going to be from that first federal Thanksgiving that's going to be um, proclaimed in 1782, November 28th, 1782. So that is uh, just to make sure. And that's going to be that's going to be the one that's on the the last Thursday in November. So you're going to have a um, and that's going to be the I'm trying to think. So this November who proclaimed that one? It says um, Thanksgiving and National Day of Prayer proclaimed November fifth. 1782, the first being observed on November 28th, 1782. And that's the, what was that called that, that proclaimed that? Because it's before we have a president. It's the something Congress. I always forget the name of it. The Continental Congress? Continental Congress, that's it. So the Continental Congress is going to proclaim that National Day of Prayer and Thanksgiving. But George Washington, as the president of the United States, gives a Thanksgiving proclamation that's also going to be observed on the last Thursday in November. And that one pairs with uh, Lincoln's, right, both to the date of proclamation and to the date in which it is on the Gregorian calendar. And and from then on, we're going to have the last Thursday in November uh, as uh, Thanksgiving, except I think it's Truman or something who does something different with the Thanksgiving uh, that ends up being, I I can't remember what he did with that. do, Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I really don't. Okay, now are you, are you talking about his proclamation 2673 Thanksgiving Day of 1945. That's what I don't know. Um, because he's he's got a couple of proclamations when he would while he was president. One was proclamation 2673, then there's proclamation 2709 of Thanksgiving of 1946, and proclamation 2756. Of 1947. Okay, so what he does is he changes it to the fourth Thursday, not the last Thursday. Okay. Or something like that, which, which is a, a, a like an odd sort of distinction. But um, I'm not sure how that would necessarily affect it. I guess technically you could have a last Thursday that would be a little bit later or something. I'm not sure how that would work. Um, anyway, there's something that he did regarding Thanksgiving having to do with, yeah, because he does one in 45 and 47. He did one in 46 as well. Okay. Well, yeah, normally they, they do a Thanksgiving Day proclamation. So I, I think he just simply changed it to the fourth from the last because it's always the last Thursday, right? Or is it is it is it always the fourth Thursday? I can't remember. So if somebody can figure that out, but anyway, otherwise, it's it's always going to be a certain Thursday, which is I think the last Thursday. Maybe it's the fourth Thursday. I'm not sure. Um, how you guys define that. Okay. But anyway, that, that's the only difference. So I just mention it. It's, I don't know how important it is in, in the context of all of this, but the main idea is that we have these Thanksgivings. So we have this, this line of Thanksgivings 
um, and and there's also national days of prayer and so forth. So they have these national fasts. So I found that rather interesting. So January 1st, 1795, a national fast was appointed for February 19th, 1795. So I don't think you would have national fasts being proclaimed by presidents nowadays. Right? Has anybody ever heard of a president proclaiming a national fast? Yeah, Lincoln did. Yeah, but I'm saying in recent times. No. No. So, so it's something that, that's, you know, sort of outdated. Um, cause it's more a religious idea, right? And then January 1st, 1863, of course, we have the national fast and that one Ellen White approves of because it's going to be connected to the Emancipation Proclamation. And there was a fast earlier regarding the war that Ellen White said that Adventists should not participate in. <clears throat> then, of course, he proclaims this Thanksgiving on November, on October 3rd for November 26th that pairs with George Washington's. So to me, that's a pretty interesting coincidence. Those, the date of proclamation and the fact that that's now a fixture. But it's connected with the Civil War, the other one connected with the beginning of the United States. Um, yeah, so there's 49 days between um, when the fast is given um, or, or proclaimed to when it uh, occurs. And that's going to be the one February 19th. So you're going to see that's going to be 49, 50 days, I guess, depending how you count it. Um, so then when we deal with Trump's first Thanksgiving, November 17th, uh, he's going to, uh, proclaim that. And then it's going to be November 23rd, 2017. And then his second Thanksgiving is the one that we were pointing to Trump's hand being restrained and the November 9th date there. Uh, the reason why that to me seems significant that November 9th and November 22nd are a, symbol that that fits together um is that we had this november 9th date and and i was saying well you know if we can predict events this is a structure that should give us an event and if an event doesn't occur then we know we can't predict events Right, because we're connecting things that we already saw. But of course, remember, it's not going to be till November 10th, 20, uh, 20 or 2019, pardon me, that Jeff is actually going to sit down. We're going to go over it and then he's going to say, yeah, this is okay. Just he interprets the event at the end differently. So does this, does this help? Is this sort of establish that there is a connection between these revolutionary wars and civil wars? We want to call the one in 977 as a parallel to the Revolutionary War and the one in 742 as a parallel to the Civil War. And then that we can connect those spans of time to what happens in 2018 with Trump, just marking that there, that we're in the time of the Civil War. I think we're making the prima facie case. Okay. All right. So, so to me, it, it seems like this, this was valid. Jeff said it was valid. I thought it was valid. And, but I also say that from this, we cannot predict, we, we definitely could not predict what the event would be. Right. That that was something we shouldn't be able to do. Um, and, and we shouldn't be trying to do. We shouldn't be trying to predict events. So the 154 years, of course, between Trump's first Thanksgiving and Lincoln's Thanksgiving on the Thursday uh, in 1863, I still think is significant. It's 77 times two, but it's also um the number of days inclusive count in Samuel Snow's letters. So that 154 years is significant. 
The November 22nd just becomes significant because of its being November 22nd um, and in the time of Trump. And it was just before November 22nd of 2018 that we discovered this structure. So just a few days prior. So I think I would have done this on hmm, probably was like the 19th or something like that that I drew out this, you know, that we figured it out and drew it out. I might have drawn it out on the 20th. I can't remember. I could I could look at my old emails and find out when when this was. Um, but it was just before November 22nd. Now, back when we were doing this, so at the camp meeting in, so the camp meeting was in October. And uh, in October, there was, a lady there at uh, the camp meeting who who lived not far from the school of the prophet. She had moved there. She actually was uh, there in um, 2016 when we there, were there. She had just become an Adventist and she was still there in 2018. And uh, uh, it's at her place that we had this study. But prior to this study, because this is in November, uh, back in October during the camp meeting, she had been doing a study regarding uh, the days of prayer, these national days of prayer, and um, which I thought was interesting. So I did have my sort of my attention drawn to this, this national day of prayer um, back at the camp meeting in October of 2018. But it wasn't until just just before the Thanksgiving that, you know, Heidi started looking at the Civil War visions. And that led us to uh, drawing out this line and then making this uh, uh, tentative prediction. You know, what could happen if this line is correct? So I still think the line is correct. But nothing nothing happened that we could predict. But how do we address this now? Because all it, what it would be doing is it would be connecting these civil wars in ancient Israel with the civil wars of the United States. And, and that we already have, right? Because we can say that the prophetic mirror already connects these, correct? Right. Right. A nation that arises in 1798. Ellen White says that's the United States. That's the two horned beast. It arises in 1798. She doesn't put 1776. So why does she put 1798 instead of 1776? If, if I'm reading her correctly. I'm going to read the statement here. It's from Great Controversy. Now she says a little before 1798, some power of satanic character would rise to war upon the Bible. So that's going to be the French Revolution. Where is this here? One actually, I'm looking at this condensed version of the Great Controversy. Okay, I'm going to read these statements because there's a few different times that she mentioned 1798 in the Great Controversy. So she's going to first talk about uh, the period of 1260 years and 1798. That's in page uh, 266 and 267. She's going to talk about the two witnesses, right? And then in, in 268 at the end, she's going to talk about when they have finished their testimony, right? The two witnesses were to prophesy clothed in sackcloth. And then uh, a couple paragraphs down, I guess I can show this to you so you can see it. She says, according to the words of the prophet, then a little before the year 1798, some power of satanic origin and character would rise to make war upon the Bible. And in the land where the testimony of God's witnesses should thus be silenced, there would be manifest the atheism of the Pharaoh and the licentiousness of Sodom. The prophecy has received a most exact and striking fulfillment in the history of France during the revolution of 1798. Right. And see here. She's going to talk about, uh, 25 years prior to the end of 1798, the Lisbon earthquake, all these harbingers. And I'm trying to find. So this is it. 
So it's talking again. This is page 439 and 440, where she's going to talk about the end of the 1260. And then she's going to say in 440, paragraph 1, but the beast with lamb-like horns was seen coming up out of the earth. Instead of overthrowing other powers to establish itself, the nation thus represented must arise in territory previously unoccupied and grow up gradually and peacefully. It could not then arise among the crowded and struggling nationalities of the old world, that turbulent sea of peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. It must be sought in the Western continent. What nation of the new world was in 1798 rising into power, giving promise of strength and greatness and attracting the attention of the world? The application of the symbol admits of no question. One nation, and only one, meets the specifications of this prophecy. It points unmistakably to the United States of America. Again and again, the thought, almost the exact words of the sacred writer has been unconsciously employed by the orator and the historian in describing the rise and growth of this nation. The beast was seen coming up out of the earth, and according to the translators, the word here rendered coming up literally signifies to grow or spring up as a plant. And as we have seen, the nation must arise in territory previously unoccupied. A prominent writer describing the rise of the United States speaks of the mystery of her coming forth from vacancy and says, like a silent seed, we grew into an empire. Uh, the New World, uh, so that's J. Townsend, The New World Compared with the Old, page 462. A European journal in 1850 spoke of the United States as a wonderful empire which was emerging and amid the silence of the earth daily adding to its power and pride. That's from the Dublin nation. Right. So anyway, the idea here is he had two horns like a lamb. The lamb-like horns indicate youth, innocence, and gentleness fitly representing the character of the United States when presented the new prophet as coming up in 1798, right? So to me, Ellen White is saying that the United States is coming up in 1798. So, so what does that mean particularly about, um, and, and I have looked at other things that show that it, it took time for other nations to recognize the United States it's not like everybody all recognized it at the same time as being an independent nation. Um, my understanding is that they uh, they had a navy in 1798, which uh, led to some nations recognizing them as an independent nation. But I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that, Dwight, regarding uh, the rise of the United States in 1798, the significance of that date? Okay, so we have 1798. This is my view is that this is when the United States really becomes a nation, not 1776. And that this parallels uh, with what happens in 977 BC. So I'm just trying to think here about this. It's kind of interesting. This is Great Controversy 441, which in reverse is 144. So we're, we're going to know about the Declaration of Independence. That's going to be in 1776. So how do we account for this 1798, the rise of the United States? Any thoughts on this? Okay. When we have this regarding the rise of the United States tied with Islam, because from 1798 to 1805, didn't they fight what was called the Barbary Wars? Right. That's what I, I knew you were going to talk about. Something about that. And that, so the Barbary Wars has to do with the fact the United States has a Navy, right? In order to fight those wars. Well, they, they've now become more of a, um, a global power. Right. And so that's the Barbary Coast, which, uh, where exactly is that? Uh, North Africa. Okay. So North Africa, do more specific? Like, it's not in the Mediterranean. It's well, more... Okay. North um, Africa is part of the Mediterranean. Yes. But what I'm just saying is, it, do they have to go into the Mediterranean to fight on the Barbary Coast? So that's what I'm asking. Because, I mean, there's parts of North Africa. I don't know specifically 
how you cl classify North Africa. But there's parts of the northern part of the continent that is, um, uh, let me see, I'm just going to get a map here so I can address this. But, um, okay. Right. So when you're looking at Africa, like you got Morocco, that's not in the Mediterranean. Well, yeah, those, it is. Well, no, but I'm saying you can go to Morocco before you go uh, through the, the Gibraltar Pass, right? Because you got Casablanca, uh, um, Marrakech, Morocco. These are all, this is in North Africa, but you're not in the Mediterranean. Okay. You know, and first, of course, you have the Aborian Sea and the, you know, all of this other Where, stuff going there. So when you have straight, in North Africa, Tunisia. When, yeah, you have okay. the straight, when you have the Straits of Gibraltar, yeah. that's between Spain and Morocco. Yeah. Now, your Barbary Coast would have taken you from Morocco, of which part of Morocco is going to be outside of what we would call the Mediterranean. Yeah, I mean, technically it's the Alborian Sea. Okay. But but we kind of just think of the whole thing as the Mediterranean, but yes. Okay. Okay. Now, after you pass through the Straits of Gibraltar, mm -hmm. you're still going to run along the Moroccan coast. You will then be running along the Algerian coast. Yeah. Up to Tunisia. Yeah. And then you're going to be running to what some are going to call Tripoli. Yeah. Which is next to Egypt at this point, right? Yeah, it's spots in Libya. Yeah, where Muammar Gaddafi had been. Yeah. Now, all of that portion was known as the Barbary Coast. So all of this here. Correct. Be before the Straits of Gibraltar and after. Correct. Okay. Okay. So that's just what I wanted to know. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's going to be Morocco, Algiers, Tunisia, Libya, that area. So the, so the Americans are now over here. Now, why were they over here? Well, this well the American shipping had been doing trade and ships from the Barbary Coast pirates from the Barbary Coast had taken American ships captive. Okay. So they're they, protecting, protecting their trade routes, so Correct. To speak. Exactly. Okay. And so it, obviously to, to do that, uh, they need a Navy. And my understanding is that they get this Navy in yeah, 1798. But I'm, I would have to confirm that, but that's just something I read before. They they got the Navy prior to 1798 because there were quite a few naval battles that were fought as part of the American Revolution. Yes, yeah. So so I'm not sure why I read that they, they officially had a Navy in 1798. So, um, so I'm not sure about that fact. But maybe that's where their Navy is going to be actively involved in other areas rather than the revolution or something like that. I would that. think that to be correct. Okay. okay. So anyway, that was, uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of American history we have to learn here, um, to understand this. But, but we can see then that 1798, we have a pairing with 977 BC. Right. We have that right. whole revolution leading to obviously the end of the 2520 for Northern Israel. It's, it's going to be connected because we have the 235 years and the 235 months. Right. Those things connecting 742, which is of course going to then parallel 1863. So you have the revolution, then the civil war, the revolution, the civil war. So I know, you know, some of the stuff that we're doing, 
uh, for somebody watching this, this might be a little bit boring, um, watching us sort of pick through all of this. Uh, but I think it's important that we do this. I mean, I keep always making apologies about it. But people can see the process that we go through. You know, we try to be to be fair. Like we try to be objective. And we try to be thorough, right? So those are important aspects, and people can see that. But at some point, we have to get this whole study and bring it all together and and complete it, because really it's not a completed study. You know, the School of the Prophets didn't want to study this. Right. And I, I still think it's significant that we we look at this. You know, and we're going to have things, you know, which we never really address. But, you know, August 9th, 1623 is going to be the first civil Thanksgiving. It's either August 9th or July 30th. There's disagreements about that. Um, and then you're going to have the, the proclaimed November 1st American Thanksgiving on December 18th, 1777. Um, so it's going to be proclaimed November 1st and it's on December 18th. Um, you know, things like that. It, how are these significant? You know, we see there's 154 years between this first civil Thanksgiving, so that's, and then this proclaimed Thanksgiving in America. Um, you know, and is, is that significant as far as the structure is concerned? And two, three, four, five years between 723 and 1623. And there was other things that we studied as well, um, at the camp meeting. Uh, which we're going to look at. We're going to look at uh, the July 27th and their connection to uh, American history. So, so there's going to be a few different things that uh, we're going to address as as we look at American history. So, suggest people who are studying this. If you don't know much about American history, this is a good way to get some American history, but also maybe brushing up if you don't know it well spend a bit of time just reading some some of this history, which I'm going to try to do. So anyway, let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we've had here today to study your word and for uh, the work that you are doing upon our hearts. And we just pray, Lord, that your angels can watch over us, that your spirit can work upon us and that we can obey your voice. We know, Lord, there's many trials ahead for each one of us and trials that we have passed through, and trials that we may be even in the midst of. But we know, Lord, that you care for us, that you are always there. And uh, we ask that you can continue to be with us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.